So I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce our next speaker because the whole of the Music Tech Fest and MTF Labs started with this grand ambition of mine of uniting disciplines in a space of common understanding. And there was someone who got that whole idea a long time before me and had already written an entire program for Parsons School of Design in transdisciplinarity. Um, so a veteran of this space and a veteran of uniting people in um, collaborative environments. Um, and also someone who has curated seminal uh, programs uh, together with Paolo Antonelli at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And I will have the privilege to meet um, Jamer at the European Bauhaus Festival. And we just hit it off from the start for obvious reasons. We're both into really creating these incredible environments. And I just wish Jamer was here with us in person. But failing that and having uh, authored amazing works which I think relate to some of the spe speeches and some of the inspirational talks we've heard about scaling from the ground up about about sort of some of the things for instance that Jan Orman was talking to us about on Monday um, the subject matter of uh, Jamer's book really deals with some of this so um, in short I'll pass uh, this on over to him to tell us about and please a round of applause for Jamer Hunt Thanks so much, um, Michaela and Andrew, for this invitation. I'm just um, terribly sad that I can't be there with you this week. Um, I'd hoped to maybe make it happen, but a surprise trip to Australia kind of changed my plans for this fall a little bit. So I'll try and make it another year, but um, it sounds like an extraordinary event, um, really one that I, I won't miss in the future if I can uh, if I can make sure I can make it there somehow. So what I'm going to do, I think, is uh, what I want to do first is share my screen. I'm looking, I'm currently, what I see from my screen is, it seems to be a ceiling and lights. Um, so I'm hoping that I will uh, get us here um, where we need to be. So if all is working well, hopefully you're now seeing a big and symbol. And, uh, oh, hold on, um, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to um, just make sure to share. Uh, um, so thanks so much. So what I wanted to talk about today, I guess, um, uh, thank you for even devoting an hour um, to this. Uh, there's a lot to cover um, and I'm gonna move fast, but I really wanna talk about um, some recent work I've been doing and some new work I've been doing uh, really around the issue of uh, systems and systems design, which is kind of the focus of my um, work, but my work is generally focused on kind of the poetics and the politics of systems and how we try to design within complex systems, whether those are biological systems, technical systems, or social systems. Um, if I advance my screen, sometimes this doesn't work. Are you now seeing a picture of a city? So, um, what I want to do is kind of um, help us to understand in the first part of this talk, um, what our, why our relationship to scale is changing. And then the second part really shift a little bit and, and explore some new work and I'll get to that along the way. Um, but for me, you know, I've been uh, just recently wrote a book a couple of years back called um, Not to Scale. And, you know, a lot of us think of scale as a relatively simple uh, framework for, for kind of measuring the world, for understanding the world around us. It's not a particularly sophisticated framework or concept, um, but for me, what's really essential is that we start to think of scale as a framework through which we think the present. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, to begin with, you know, as I said, we tend to think of scale as something relatively straightforward. Um, and so, you know, we use it to measure, let's say, as, as on, the, uh, on the left, to measure time, for instance, as a way of uh, kind of using scale to know what time of day it is, or our place in the world. So the compass helps us to understand kind of where we are in relation to others, or even the temperature. Um, one of the things you can think about is that scale helps to kind of organize experience, um, that it's a way of taking these things that we can't always touch and feel, like orientation or weather, um, or time, and it helps to organize those in ways that allows us in some ways to kind of share that. So for instance, um, 
if I ask you what's the temperature outside and you say it's cold, um, you know, your cold may not be my cold. Uh, you might only need a sweater, I might need a parka. Um, and so the cold doesn't really quite do it, but if I say it's, you know, zero degrees centigrade, um, then we have an absolute and shared kind of cultural framework for understanding what that temperature is. And I know how to dress for zero degrees, you might dress differently, but we now have that shared mechanism. So scale not only creates culture, but it helps to organize experience into something that's knowable. Uh, that we can really put our finger on. Um, and what I'm going to argue um, is that we have seen some profound kind of transformations in our relationship to scale. Um, and to do that, um, I want to start off, and I'm hoping that the sound works here, um, I want to start off with two clips from two really uh, critical films when understanding scale. So let me get to those and, and hopefully this all works and you can hear the sound all right. The picnic near the lakeside in Chicago is the start of a lazy afternoon, early one October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now every 10 seconds we will look from 10 times farther away and our field of view will be 10 times wider. This square is 10 meters wide and in 10 seconds the next square will be 10 times as wide. Our picture will center on the picnickers even after they've been lost to sight. 100 meters wide. The distance a man can run in 10 seconds. Cars crowd the highway. Power boats lie at their docks. The colorful bleachers are soldiers field. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. 10 to the fourth meters, 10 kilometers. The distance a supersonic airplane can travel in 10 seconds. We see first the rounded end of Lake Michigan, then the whole great lake. 10 to the fifth meters, the distance an orbiting satellite covers in 10 seconds. Long parades of clouds, the day's weather in the Middle West. 10 to the 6th, a 1 with 6 zeros, a million meters. Soon the Earth will show as a solid sphere. We are able to see the whole Earth now, just over a minute along the journey. This is a top to, uh, you know, what we use on stage, but it's very, very special because if you can see, yeah. the numbers all go to 11. Look, right across the board. Oh. 11, oh, 11, and most of 11, and then amps go up to 10. Exactly. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? It's not 10. You see, most most blokes are going to be playing at 10. You're on 10 here, all the way up, all the way up, yeah. all the way up. You're on 10 on your guitar. Where can you go from there? Where? I don't know. Nowhere. Exactly. What we do is, if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Uh, put it up to 11. 11. Exactly. One louder. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. If you're not familiar with that, the first clip was from The Powers of 10 by Charles and Ray Eames, um, one of the kind of iconic films of design. Uh, and in that, what you see is this remarkable um, demonstration of a very simple principle that as you shift in scale, the information changes. So what starts out as a, um, a picture of two picnickers on a blanket in Chicago um, having a picnic, you, you keep the camera in a sense focused on that same spot. But as you move out, the information changes, you start to see Chicago. And in a sense, your frame changes, your understanding changes. And as you move all the way out in that, and it goes further in fact than the film itself, as you go out and you suddenly see the globe, you're now put in that position of that iconic uh, photograph that we see of the earth from a distance um, where you know the environmental precarity of the globe itself becomes primary and the individual seems insignificant in comparison. Um, and so it's a wonderful sort of exploration. And I'll use that a little bit later. Um, the second part is a clip from uh, a wonderful movie called This is Spinal Tap. It's a, a fake documentary about an aging heavy metal band. Um, and what's wonderful about that, not only because it's just a great clip, um, is that it's a kind of 
wonderful epistemological conversation about you know whether scale has a kind of a natural basis to it um does scale represent something is 10 always 10 and is 11 always one louder um or as the interviewer is suggesting is it in fact a kind of human artifice is it a framework that we as humans impose upon the world that's entirely artificial in its um orientation in its kind of numbering in all those different ways in which we tend to measure things. Are we really measuring them in absolute terms or are we really just um, imposing human frameworks and constructs upon the world itself? So there's a wonderful philosophical conversation about the nature of scale embedded in that simple conversation. Um, what I wanna talk about in um, building off of that is really um, what I see as a kind of fundamental shift in our in the world in which we live in. Uh, in the worlds in which we live in, and really prompted by two transformations. The first is a kind of um, transformation of the physical to the digital, the second being the proliferation of entangled networks around the world and networks built upon networks built upon networks. And what I'm going to argue is that this creates a kind of new physics um, of scale, a new kind of perceptual and conceptual reality for us that we're not really paying attention to, but that is in many ways kind of driving some of the kind of paralysis that we face when it deal when dealing with some of the wicked problems of today. So first I want to talk about the ways in which the kind of dematerialization, the movement from the physical to the to the digital is changing our perceptual apparatus. And I'm gonna use an example in sort of uh inches here, but you'll get this the idea. So um this is a this is a screen grab of uh Microsoft Word. Um and if you notice kind of at the top, uh, it says I'm viewing this at 100%. And so this is a, in, in our system, an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper that I've, uh, that's, that's how it's described in Microsoft Word. So I've loaded an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper into this on my computer, and it's now showing that at 100%. So what is 100% of eight and a half by 11 inches? Well, of course it's eight and a half by 11 inches, but if I take out my ruler as I did, and I actually measure on my screen, the size of that paper, it's five and a half by eight inches. So somehow in this world we're comfortable with, we don't quite mind, we're, or we're not paying attention to the fact that 100% of eight and a half by 11 inches is five and a half by eight inches. That sort of slippage is something that seems to happen all the time. Um, and yet we don't seem to care, even though we would certainly care if that was going on in the physical world. In a similar kind of way, we might look at these two images and say that they are to our kind of optical systems identical. Phenomenologically, they seem like the same image, but the one on the left is 500 by 800 pixels and the one on the right is 5,000 by 8,000 pixels. Uh, so by no means are they the same in scale and yet they can appear to us to be identical in scale. Um, and you know, oftentimes we will um, experience this if you work in design, particularly if you're doing graphics, um, you've probably experienced this where you're working with something on your computer screen and you, you're building, let's say, making a poster and you're kind of getting everything laid out on screen and you've got all the proportions right and the type size right and the image size right and all that kind of stuff. And then you go and you print that out and you look at it and you kind of go, nah, something's not right proportionally. That what you're seeing on the screen, the scale, even though it has a kind of one-to-one -one relationship to the printout, somehow doesn't look right when they translate from the digital to the physical. There's a slippage in our kind of phenomenological perception of scale, shape, size, um, that is fundamentally kind of altering our understanding of the world, um, but in ways that we're sometimes not paying attention to. And I think about this also because, you know, I spend, and many of us spend, the, the data is pretty clear now that we're spending six, eight, 10 hours in front of screens on any given day. Um, and that's now a pretty much a normal part of the world that we're living in. Um, and yet we're living in this world with a new kind of physics. Um, and for me, where it really hits home is, you know, I have, um, I'm old enough to have kind of had a, been of a generation where I used to keep all my files in boxes in the basement and all my photographs in boxes in basement, all my albums in boxes in the basement, and you have to move them every time you moved. Um, all of that is now on my laptop. And so all of my, you know, whatever, 20,000 images, however much music I have, all the pictures of my kids, my will, all of the work that I've done for the past 20 years is on a device that gets slimmer and slimmer thinner and thinner, lighter and lighter, even as the material that I'm creating is more and more and more. So there's this kind of uh, paradoxical relationship between the amount that I'm producing and 
it's not growing in scale, it's shrinking in scale. And so, you know, I ask, like, how much does a gigabyte weigh? A gigabyte is a fundamental part of our world now. We think about how many photographs we have in terms of gigabytes, and yet we have no perceptual relationship to that. We don't know if we add a gigabyte of information to our laptop, does it feel heavier? Would it feel heavier? Do you even know the answer to that? And yet this is a fundamental building block of the world that we now live in. But in addition to that kind of um, uh, sort of uh, phenomenological or, or perceptual um, confusion that's happening in this digital engagement, the kind of interconnectedness of all of these networks is also creating a kind of conceptual entanglement that I think is at the heart of some of the struggles that we have. And I'll just give you two very quick examples for this. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, so this is a diagram that was created um, for uh, General Stanley McChrystal, who was the head of NATO counterinsurgency efforts um, in Afghanistan. And um, there was a, uh, this was an attempt to give some scope to the kinds of interconnectedness and the different forces at play within Afghanistan during the counterinsurgency. Um, and when, uh, when General Stanley McChrystal walked in one morning to a PowerPoint presentation, and he was shown this slide, it was produced by staffers to help him understand kind of the situation on the ground. He famously said, when we understand this slide, we'll have won the war. And you might just think that's a kind of, you know, a quip, a, a funny line, but it's a really a profound statement about a transformation of what constitutes war. When we think of war, historically, we think of it as force against force, that my club is bigger than your club or my gun is bigger than your gun, or my bomb is bigger than your bomb, that scale matters in force um, and in impact. And yet what he's suggesting is in fact that the fundamental understanding of war has shifted from one of a physical force and physical matter to information and logistics. And the understanding, whoever understands logistics better, faster, sooner will have won the war. And what he's really describing is a really fascinating transformation where the information, the signal has reached a scale of complexity where it becomes noise, where it's had a kind of phase shift like water shifting into ice when it reaches a certain temperature, enough of this information and suddenly it becomes noise instead of signal. Um, or this image from Chris Jordan from a series of uh, images that he created called Running the Numbers. and. Um, this is an attempt, I would argue, to try and help us understand the scale of the environmental catastrophe that we're creating. This is, um, this is a constructed image, and it, is, um, it represents the number of plastic bottles consumed in the United States every five minutes. And I think the reason this is so powerful, and you can, it's beautiful online, you can sort of zoom in and zoom out, and I encourage you to. Um, what's extraordinary about this, I think, is the attempt to, to shift our, our kind of thinking can shift our conceptual apparatus in a way because we can't actually understand the scale of the environmental catastrophe that we're creating. We can't think at the scale of the globe. And what we use instead is things like polar bears on ice flows to try and tug on the heartstrings of people to get them to, to change their behaviors. And what he's trying to do in this image is to give us some sense of scale so that we can begin to kind of wrap our minds around the environmental catastrophe that we're creating. It's very hard to understand what it feels like to increase the global temperature by two degrees. But when you start to see an impact like this, you begin to be able to understand um, the scale of our impact on the world and the, the just the complexity of the, the impact that we're creating. And so one of the things I really want to impress on you today is this idea that as we shift in scale within complex systems, we encounter surprises. Um, that as you move in scale, as I will argue, the kind of the problem changes. Um, and you know, we can think I, we can think of this in really simple ways. So um, this is a kind of linear relationship of more and better. Um, you know, the the more I practice guitar, the better I play. There's a kind of one to one or a linear relationship in this. Um, the more chocolate chips you put in the chocolate chip cookie, the better the chocolate chip cookie is. Um, but this is not, this sort of linear relationship is not what's interesting to me. What I'm interested in is what's happening with these scalar shifts where you are getting um, sort of breaks in that linearity where it becomes non-linear in its relationship. And you put in too much chocolate chips into a chocolate chip cookie and it's all chocolate and it just scorches on the pan. 
no longer becomes a cookie. So you get a fundamental shift in what you're actually encountering. And so for me, I'm really interested in these moments where systems increase or shrink in scale, and suddenly you get a kind of fundamental or nonlinear break, because I think that's what's happening in so many of the systems that we're dealing with. And so I'll give you a few examples of this. Um, so the first um, comes is a wonderful thought experiment from an Austrian botanist named Fritz Vent, who asked the question, um, can an ant learn to read? And <clears throat> so you would think, well, you know, ants are not individually that smart, but maybe they're, they're smart as colonies. So maybe collectively they have enough intelligence to learn how to read. And his response was, well, at the scale of an ant, if you scale a book down to the size of an ant, that the uh, the bonds between the electrons and the pages are so strong at that scale that an ant wouldn't be able to turn the pages. So as you shift in scale, the problem changes. It's no longer a problem of whether the ant is intelligent enough, but it's at the scale of the ant, the pages in the book are so strongly held together that you would never be able to turn the page in a book. And so then he asked, well, you know, can an ant take a shower? And you would say, well, you know, that's an obvious one. Of course, an ant can take a shower. You know, the shower comes down and the ant's underneath it. That's really, that makes total sense. But at the scale of the ant, as you move down in a scale, the problem changes. And the problem is that at the scale of the ant, the surface tension on a drop of water is so strong at that scale that the water, uh, the drop of water bounces off an ant rather than washes off the ant. So ants clean themselves by using their forelegs to scrape. Um, rather than to kind of wash themselves or bathe themselves for the exact reason you can see here. So what I'm suggesting is that as you shift in scale, the problem changes in fundamental ways. And this was a problem that became uh, a fundamental disagreement between say Albert Einstein and quantum physicists who were trying to understand what goes on at the quantum level. And Einstein described the, the principles that quantum physicists were trying to describe as spooky action at distance. Um, and what do you mean by that? Well, in quantum physics, there's this basic notion that, so you've moved down really far in scale now. So there's a basic notion that if you shoot out two identical photons in separate opposite directions, so they're identical in all ways, and you separate them by a distance, and let's just call that distance the universe. Um, and if you impart a spin on one of those photons in, one unit, you know, at the other side of the universe, that you will simultaneously at that exact same moment have the exact same spin on the other photon all the way across the universe. That there are principles that happen at the level of quantum physics um, that shift our entire understanding of the physical universe and how it works. So as you shift at scale, the problem changes. Um, but let's look at more, that more is sometimes stranger. So um, this is an ad for, uh, for Strava, which is a, um, a sort of uh, running and bicycle riding and walking platform that will kind of measure where you've gone. It will map where you've gone. It will analyze that. Um, I'm a runner, so I use this to kind of map my runs and analyze my runs and understand if I'm running slower or faster from one day to the next. And there are millions of people who use Strava. And one of the things that the uh, um, one of the things the company did a few years back was they decided that they had these mountains of big data um, and that they wanted to make that public because it might by make that by making that database public, it would allow people to visualize things in new ways. It would allow people um, to do innovative things with the information. It would make the company seem more transparent in what it's doing. Um, so they really, they opened the database um, in a kind of wonderful uh, gesture. Uh, what they didn't realize, however, was that the U.S. government had given its soldiers Fitbits, and the soldiers um, wearing these Fitbits, and the Fitbits were given to them to, to help them to become healthier, uh, particularly in the United States. We have some issues with um, obesity, and, and that's affecting the, the military. And so um, the U.S., the soldiers were wearing the Fitbits um, and they were using Strava to map their runs. But what they didn't realize was that as you get more and more of this data and you build more and more of this data, that what was happening is, is people were visualizing the runs that people were doing, but they were discovering that there were these, the existence of these funny shapes uh, in places that no one should be. And in particular uh, in the deserts of Afghanistan. And what they realized was that this was now revealing secret military bases that the US had that were being in a sense drawn by the runners 
Um, and so you can see the sort of outlines of um, the base in the desert, uh, that top secret military bases were being revealed through this kind of public database and that you build enough of a database with enough runners in it and you suddenly discover surprises that you never could have imagined were in there. And so what I'm trying to get at is that there is this um, kind of uh, system overload that's happening where we feel as though there are issues that we maybe once could deal with at a local level or a regional level or a city level or a governmental or a, a, a national level that somehow now seem almost impossible to deal with. Um, and they range from, you know, from our global pandemic to systemic racism, to the climate crisis, to authoritarianism, to surveillance capitalism, persistent poverty, the refugee crises, gender violence, political gridlock. In the United States, we have this um, phrase that came up during the collapse of banks um, uh, in 2008, or probably even earlier, um, that they were too big to fail. And you can think of a company like uh, Facebook right now, a private company that could we argue they're too big to fail? Do Have we created too much infrastructure based upon them for our social well-being that if they were to fail, we would lose key capacities? I hope not. Um, I, but, you know, we're dealing with a set of problems that seem in every instance to uh, outstrip our capacity to even make modest uh, impact upon them. So what do we do? Um, what do we do about that? Do we just kind of, you know, put our heads underneath the blanket? Um, what I wanna offer is not solutions, but some strategies in the book. I offer a few more of these. I'm just gonna offer one for the sake of time today that I call scalar framing, which is a way to address complex situations, borrowing from Charles and Ray Eames's uh, framework to think about a way of um, designing differently. So let's say for a hypothetical example here that um, we want to make bicycle riding easier in the city. Um, and so, and we're going to use the, the Eames's powers of 10. We'll say just arbitrarily that 10 to the power of one is the, the sort of um, the scale of the human body. And if we wanted to make bicycle riding easier, we might say, well, one of the things you could do at the scale of the human body is you could make the bicycle uh, lighter weight. Uh, you can make it easier to fold, cleaner to carry around, easier to bring onto public transit or to bring into your office. And so you might say at 10 to the power of one from a design standpoint, this is a kind of uh, product design or industrial design problem. But as you move out to 10 to the uh, power of two, as you move out one scale, you suddenly are looking at the same problem of bicycling at the level of the street. And you realize in a city like New York City, um, it's no longer just bicycles, cars, and pedestrians, but we have roller skaters, scooters, pedicabs, those one-wheeled things. Um, there's a proliferation of all sorts of modes of transportation. And so you realize that 10 to the power of two, as you scale out a little bit, the problem changes as you shift in scale, that it becomes a sort of urban design problem as much as it is a, pro a problem at the scale of the individual. And if you move out to 10 to the power of three, you realize, well, you know, wouldn't it be nice if everybody in New York had a bicycle? But at 10 to the power of three, you realize there's a kind of architectural or spatial design challenge. The problem changes once again, that we couldn't store all those bikes uh, in New York City. The sidewalks, the apartments are simply not big enough to have that many bicycles. I mean, they are big enough, but it would create a whole new set of problems as a result of that. So 10 to the power of three, the problem changes not just is it convenient to carry my bike inside, but do I have the space? Do we have the space for all those bicycles? And if you move out to 10 to the power of four, you might say, well, you know, here's an idea. How about a bike share system? And so City Bike was started in New York City several years back. Um, and at 10 to the power of four, you realize it's a service design problem. If you wanted to give everybody access to bicycles, let's say, well, Nobody, we can't have everybody owning them. So let's just have enough bicycles so everyone can use them when they want. We'll create a bike share system. But at 10 to the power of four, you realize it's a um, service design issue in the sense that, first of all, you have to be able to deal with people with different languages. There are hundreds of languages spoken in New York City. You have to make sure that uh, people with different currency uh, can use those systems. More importantly, you have to be able to make sure that the bicycles are redistributed every single night so that they're evenly spread out throughout the city or spread out in the right kinds of patterns because what happens in the course of a day is they tend to move from one area to the other and need to get redistributed. So 10 to the power of four becomes a service design problem. And if you move out to 10 to the power of five and you said, well, let's say we were living in South Orange and wanted to use our bicycle um, 
on public transit to get to our office in Brooklyn. Um, and I have to take the New Jersey transit to a path train, then to the subway and then from the subway, then ride my bike the last bit. Um, you begin to realize that this becomes a systems integration problem of all of these kind of multimodal transportation systems around New York that are not well integrated, that would need to be integrated to allow you to sort of move across those systems smoothly. And if you move out to the power, 10 to the power of six, you begin to say, well, you know, why is it that bicycles are so um, kind of unfavored in cities? Why is it so hard to get more bicycle lanes in cities? You would think this is a public benefit for everyone. But you begin to realize that at 10 to the power of six from a kind of national or federal level, um, the United States political systems have been dominated uh, through lobbying and money um, by historically the car companies, um, which were some of the biggest companies in the country uh, up until the tech boom. And so those companies uh, made sure it was in their interest that people were in um, cars, buses, and the things that they made and sold. So 10 to the power of six, it becomes a policy design problem. How do you rethink policy in order to allow for people to be able to bicycle more freely in the city? And if you zoom out to 10 to the power of seven, and you look at this as a global challenge, you might say, well, it's wonderful if we start making bicycles, but do we know the impact of moving all of those materials around the world? Are we creating a new environmental problem by a proliferation of bicycles? So 10 to the power of seven, it becomes kind of global design, uh, resource design, problem. And so, you know, one way to look at this is to say, well, you know, how can I, des how can I design at all these scales? That's impossible. These problems are, you know, paralyzed by main capacity to design at all these scales. But what I would argue is that, um, you know, if you're a lone individual who's a product designer, then working on a bicycle makes perfect sense. Redesign the bicycle. That's maybe a scale that's appropriate to what you're doing. Um, but if you're uh, someone who's an industrial designer who rides a bike with someone on the weekend who's in city government um, and who works on policy in the city, that maybe by the two of you collaborating, um, you can start to think at the policy level about how to make a change. And that that shift in scale creates a different perspective on the kind of problem that you can address. And more importantly, as you shift in scale, not only does your perspective change, but new kinds of collaborators emerge. So for instance, maybe what you wanna do is you wanna start to involve bus drivers in your conversation because you realize at the scale of the city um, and at the policy of the city that very few people understand what's going on in the street as well as a bus driver does who has to navigate with all those bicycles. And so at each scale, as you look at the problem from these different scales, you realize you see new opportunities and you see new collaborators. And one of the things I can pretty much guarantee you um, is that if you are working on any kind of systems change project, um, you are probably always operating at one unconscious level of scale. And if you just pause and think, what happens if I move out in scale or what happens if I move up I mean, down in scale, how does the problem change for me? Do I see new opportunities? Are there things I'm not addressing because I'm not looking at that scale? So scalar framing gives you a way to not only reframe the problems that you're looking at, but it opens up new opportunities in terms of new kinds of solutions, new kinds of collaborators, new kinds of vantage points. And I would argue that there is pretty much nothing that you could work on today that isn't connected somehow globally in scale. And so every problem in some ways is both hyper-local and global at the same time. So we can no longer afford to ignore all of these scales that are connected um, with all of these problems that we're dealing with. So scalar framing is just sort of one strategy to try and tame some of the, the wickedness of the complex problems that we're engaged with. And we can think of those scales as from the individual to the interpersonal, to the family, the household, the neighborhood, as you move up in scale all the way to the planet. You can also shift that frame. Perhaps we're thinking in more biological terms about the scale of the cell or the microbe or the organism to the biome, the ecosystem, the bioregion or the atmosphere altogether. Think about how you may be working on a project right now that may be operating at the level of the plant, but what happens if you think in terms of the cell or the cellular level or the bioregion level? How does that shift the opportunities? How does that shift the possibilities? And so in this work, what I was faced with thinking about the ways in which 
these uh, kind of um, the dematerialization and the conceptual entanglement were were frustrating our capacity to make change within these systems. I kept kind of coming across this idea of sort of everywhere we look, we see landscapes of real need littered with the wreckage of dysfunctional or broken systems. The reason I thought that is because I actually wrote that. Um, I wrote that in my book, Not to Scale. Um, and this was what my thinking was that, that could we use design to improve and better these systems through kind of more clever thinking? Except, and now I'm on to part two here, maybe I was wrong. So maybe there was something fundamental and how I was thinking about this that was really the problem. And so I now wanna talk about more recent work that I've been doing, what I've been generally calling the anti-system, um, which really tries to understand what is the very nature of systems themselves? Um, do sis are systems the problem? Um, can we think about systems not in terms of making them better, but in terms of unraveling them? Maybe all systems as they grow in scale, harden, create, uh, more severe hierarchies, more disequilibrium of power of resource availability. Um, maybe systemness is the issue itself and the problem and the, the design opportunity is not to um, add more to these systems, but is to in fact unravel these systems. And this came to me in part, um, took me a long time to realize this, others have been thinking about this a lot longer. Um, with a quote from um, a wonderful student uh, speaker at our the graduation of our strategic design and management program at Parsons in, two, in 2020, who said, most systems are not broken, they are designed to be exclusionary. And this was coming in, in May of 2020, um, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd in the United States, in the um, rise of the Black Lives Matter protests, and in the calls to defund the police. And you know, you could look back at the history of police in the United States, as maybe I did, uh, too unaware um, because of my own potential privilege and, and perspective, and think that policing was a system that was broken, but that could be fixed. And what she and others were arguing instead was no, in fact, uh, this system is not broken. This system is doing exactly what it was intended to do. It was established to capture and incarcerate black people and that is what it's doing. Um, and this was not a broken system. This was a system that was behaving exactly as a system should. And so fixing that system, using design to improve that system, to intervene in that system, is that really going to change the very nature of that system? Or does that system have to, in a sense, be unraveled? And that's what the defund the police movement was really calling for, and the abolitionist movement was calling for. And so what I'm really describing here is a very different approach to design, what I call a kind of unmaking of the present. Um, and it takes currently, I mean, and this is really recent thinking, so, you know, um, uh, still a lot to develop here, but um, it takes kind of three forms in particular. First is a kind of unraveling of systems. How do you take these things that are so tightly wound into our everyday and unravel them? Um, the second is reparations, the idea, for instance, in the United States that um, that the uh, sort of original sin of, of slavery and the slave trade um, is, uh, is not a problem that it has to be designed moving into the future, but something we have to look back at the ways in which slavery has been part of our economy for 400 years and unravel those parts of the economy or in ecological thinking, you come across this with a, the movement for rewilding, um, which is really a movement to try and restore and rebuild ecosystems back to kind of an originary um, uh, form, even if it requires the reintroduction of apex predators uh, at the cost of human life and human safety. And an example of uh, this kind of unraveling that I love to give is the work of the Dutch uh, traffic engineer, Hans Monderman. And what Hans Monderman was asked to do was, he was asked to come to the city of Drachten and, and to improve this intersection. And this intersection had lots of traffic and lots of accidents. Um, and the traffic you know, just didn't move smoothly. And normally when you ask an engineer or a designer to, to fix a problem, it's sort of a, if, it, if you've got sort of a bigger problem, you need a bigger hammer. Like if, if, if this signage and all this um, traffic engineering isn't working, let's do more. That's the usual response from uh, engineers and designers. Um, 
But what's fat, oh, and, and just as a kind of a wonderful example of this, this is a picture from my hometown. Uh, my nephew pointed this out to me. There used to be a, just a four way stop with four stop signs. Um, they decided to create a roundabout in order to make traffic move more smoothly. It seemed like a good idea. This is a town of 30,000 people in a quiet residential neighborhood. Look at the number of signs that they created in order to na help people navigate this. Um, you know, this is the bigger hammer that I'm talking about, just to create a smooth roundabout in a very quiet, um, you know, little town in New Hampshire. Um, well, this is what Monderman does: is he removes everything, he unravels the traffic engineering as we know it. And what's important about this um, is that in that removal. He puts cars and bicycles and pedestrians all on the same plane, all in the same space together. And in that removal, in that unraveling, what he's done is he's fundamentally shape, shape, reshaped the problem. And as I talked about before, with this sort of shift in scale, as you move in scale, your problem changes. What he's done is he's fundamentally changed the problem from one, not of kind of more engineering, um, but of no engineering or unengineering. Uh, that environment. And what ends up happening is instead of um, the drivers, for instance, having a kind of passive relationship to the signaling of the traffic engineering and the traffic signals where we move into that intersection and we are playing a kind of passive role at the mercy of that engineering, what he's done is he's taken that all away and, and created a kind of active social choreography where if I have a pedestrian having to navigate with a bicycle and a automobile, I have to make eye contact with somebody so that they see me and I see them and we're able to navigate that space collectively in a kind of social enterprise. So it moves from a kind of engineering enterprise to a social enterprise in that sort of unraveling. And so when I'm talking about this unraveling, I'm really I'm absolutely not talking about a sort of conservative mat move back to a more wonderful past. I mean, that's the sort of conservative ideal is that the past was better and we've fallen from that. It's not what I'm arguing here. What I'm arguing is our cities can be more spectacular by the unmaking of them than by the redesigning of them and by the redesigning of those systems. And so, you know, in a kind of anti-Nike way, it's a just undo it. Um, but it's also, to my mind, kind of creates a new temporality for design. Um, and that temporality is one that moves from a kind of um, operation in the present uh, that then is looking towards the future. So people often talk about design as creating preferred futures or alternative futures. Um, and design has often been about extrapolating from the present into the future. Um, interestingly, speculative and critical design um, had a kind of a different approach, which was to sort of extrapolate into a future and bring those ideas back to the present as a critique of the present. Um, but what I'm arguing is a really different temporality to the sun making, which is an attention to the past, um, to the ways in which things, or to the, to the origins of the systems that we've created, and an unraveling of those systems within the present, not so much about creating better policing in the future, but about unraveling policing in the present. And so you think, what are these systems that can be unraveled? How far do we need to go? Should we be unraveling Facebook, for instance? What would it take to unravel something like that? Who would do it? How would we do that? What about search? Um, think about the ways in which a private company, Google, in effect owns the kind of ontology of knowledge, the ontological systems of knowledge that, that we use to kind of understand the world. So can we even unravel? What would it mean to unravel search? Um, or the infrastructure that's built our cities and our um, kind of urban, rural, suburban environments or the suburbias that um, were created based on car transportation that may no longer um, be necessary. Um, some of you I understood were working on food systems. Um, think about the ways in which we have plenty of food but a horrible uh, distribution problem when it comes to food and inequalities based on that. So do we need to rethink these food systems, unravel the sort of um, industrial food systems that we produce? Do we unravel policing? Do we need to unmake gender binaries that we've inherited? The decolonizing design movement is really um, pushing to unmake and unravel Euromodernism and the extent to which that has become the kind of um, default for what design is. Have we reached a point in our 
kind of geopolitical moment where we have to rethink and perhaps unmake democracy. It's a terrifying thought for some of us, but it's also perhaps when you look at the shape and the impact of democracy right in, now in the United States, maybe it's not the system that works best for all, but maybe works best for a few. Do we need to unmake that? And do we even need to unmake the truth or the truth as we understand it? Um, more and more, we're seeing that people can't even agree on basic notions of what is true. And if that's the case, do we need to unmake that? And so what I'm talking about is a, a really different kind of design that's focused not so much on creating a preferred future, but on reckoning with the present that we've created. And in a sense, recognizing that when we make systems, that those systems as they grow and as they mature, build in, they sort of bake in inequalities and hierarchies. That's what systems are very good at creating for efficiency. Um, and that those efficiencies and those hierarchies are what is creating the inequity, the inequality, and the injustice within these systems, the poor distribution of resources, the unjust distribution of resources. And that it's perhaps the solution is not to sort of design even harder on these systems, push even harder on the systems, maybe we now need to unmake those systems. So um, I will stop there. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you. I don't know if there's uh, capacity for questions. I'm certainly happy to take them or you have 10 minutes to do whatever you like. I'll stop sharing. Wow. Thank you so much for this. Um, I'm sure actually there's, there's questions. In fact, um, we had a speaker, so I hear last night, um, who started his uh, talk with, are there any questions before he said anything else? And there were lots of questions. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna steal that uh, one. I gotta uh, steal Dana, that, that's if you great. haven't met Jan Altosara, I will introduce you because you are both yeah. in New York. Um, but um, I actually have, uh, a, a question and and uh, well you're not surprised are you because you know this is kind of I'm, I'm so um, in 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 the same mental space that that, that you've been uh, also for a very long time and what's really interesting to me is how the first part of your talk and the second part connect and from what I understand, the way that you presented it, the second part is something that's evolving at the moment. I have a feeling that you might actually come round to the powers of 10, even in your second part, eventually. Mm. Um, and the reason I'm thinking that is I'm thinking of mental models. I, I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you about that because you introduced this idea of scale. And of course, scale, every time you discuss scale uh, and, and you present scale to us, it um, surprises us in so many different ways. And that's because uh, no matter how much we use it on a daily basis, we're still not actually trained to think on those terms. So I'm actually starting to, I, I'd like to, I'd like you to tell us a bit about, um, uh, uh, let, let me contextualize this, sorry. It's taking me a while to get round to a question. Um, the reason um, I, I, I'm asking about mental models is because I work a lot in interoperability and with data mm. systems. And as you well know, right now, um, this is like a massive priority for us to be operating off the same railway tracks. And we have a serious problem, for example, with our food systems, with our, all, all of our systems, really, um, in talking to each other via these kind of data-driven uh, systems that are now being built. And when you ask a computer scientist to start to model this sort of, a, or try to think of a solution for interoperability, first they start to think very linearly because they're just trained to do that. Then if you say, then they start to get uh, very excited if you say, oh, let's think in multidimensional terms. Mm -hmm. The first instinct is to start constructing tree structures, hierarchies, that's what mm -hmm. they do. So I work with ontologies. We have an ontology ecosystem we're trying to build. A lot of what you said in the second part of the talk was about relationships between meanings, right? I mean, there's a lot of that that comes into it. And the first thing they'll start to do is like, let's decide what is our top level ontology. Like who's the God, who dictates how we relate to each other at top level. And then we go down in hierarchical models. And from the perspective of your research and having worked with scale, 
Um, how difficult do you think it is for us who have been conditioned possibly possibly through a Judeo-Christian mythology or whatever is behind this kind of mental model that's stuck, we're stuck with it. You know, what does it take for people to switch their mental models to something alternative to this kind of traditional way of thinking that maybe would allow us to then solve some of these problems? Sorry, is that like really tricky and complicated? Uh, well, of course it's a really tricky question, but it's a wonderful question. Um, and, you know, obviously we could talk for hours about this because um, you're really talking about, you know, cognitive structures and the ways in which culture creates uh, knowledge ordering systems and what might be new knowledge ordering systems that we have to build. Um, but I would actually, um, I might approach it from a, a relatively different angle. Um, which is to say, I wonder, and this is really, I'm, I pose this back to you as a question in a sense. I wonder if rather than thinking, how do we kind of attack the problem at the highest order of our cognitive frameworks? I wonder if we said, what would happen if we took it at the simplest level of our behaviors and the ways in which, for example, a room is organized or the way in which we think about hierarchy. Hierarchy to me is such a fascinating question. Um, what if we uh, stop thinking in terms of organizational hierarchies and power hierarchies when we walk in the room. Um, and what would it mean? And I'll give you one a very concrete example of this. When I teach now, um, I often leave the room when I teach um, for the first half of class um, because uh, I want the students to have that space to, to talk about the readings um, and to create their job is to maximize discussion. That's what I challenge them to do. And and for a while I was staying in the room, but then I realized even that students would, uh, some students when they were talking would turn and look at me when they would talk rather than to each other. And I realized that there was in built within this, the kind of hierarchy of my role um, as the authority figure in that space that was you know, distorting those relationships. And so I had to actually remove myself from the space so that they could have conversations between each other. And I, in some ways I feel like you know, um, my immediate instinct is to think, well, how do we change mental models? I actually think maybe the way to go about it is to work at the simplest level of how do we change our behaviors so that they become less hierarchical, um, so that they become less conditioned by things like where the teacher sits in the room in relation to the students, for instance, just using the classroom again. Um, if the teacher sits in front and the students sit in rows, that's a relationship that's built that will never change. Um, but if we all sit on the floor in a circle, maybe you've changed that a little bit, but I'm still the teacher, everybody knows that. So I think there'd be interesting ways to think about um, using our behavioral cues to let us recognize that there are ways to do things differently with different kinds of cognitive possibilities if we just operate at a really simple level in changing our behaviors. And so I would, I would really want to experiment. And I would, I, you know, I'd really, I'm just kind of winging it here, but I would, I really love the idea that maybe, you know, instead of be, instead of kind of thinking, filtering down to behavior, maybe behavior is what will change our thinking ultimately. And we have to behave ourselves in new kind of non-hierarchical ways. Um, and particularly within our organizations, within our families, within all of these sorts of different entities. And maybe it's through those behaviors that we actually end up kind of shifting our uh, synapses and neurons rather than kind of just, if we think harder about this, we'll get it right. I, I'm not sure that's the right solution. So that would be my kind of um, immediate reaction to your really interesting question. And I, and I have no idea whether uh, I'm onto anything there. But, but no, but I, 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 I think you are, but I think also it connects, and I will give it to Dabra, because Dabra was eager to ask you something, but um, it also connects to the roundabout in the second part of your talk, yeah, where yeah. what you've done is you stripped it and you've given agency. So you've given yeah, exactly. responsibility and you've given agency. So if you create enablers, like, you know, what I hope that we create in this environment here that is an enabling environment with a level playing field where every single person has agency and has a contribution, then, then, then you can actually uh, uh, shift behaviors. Uh, then you can break down hierarchies and, 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 and change the mental models. I, I will give it over to, to Deborah, though. <laughs>
Hi, Jamie. Thank you so much for that uh, really fascinating uh, talk. I, there was one thing that really sprang out to me when you were talking about uh, unraveling systems and rewilding. Mm -hmm. And there's something in the, the language of that which sets human beings and the things that human beings make, including their systems, separate from nature. Like there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a duality there. There's, there's nature out there and there's human beings in here. And one of the things that I've, I've been trying to challenge people here to do is to try and think about human beings and their, uh, the things that they make and the systems that they create as a subset of nature and that the, there's perhaps an, an alignment problem at stake. To, to what extent is that part of this uh, rewilding and, and unraveling or, or do you still have this sort of very kind of mind-body duality where the body is, is nature and the mind is the human? No, I think that's, a, that's such a great um, observation and I, re and I really do think that the you know, the example, the very brief example I gave of rewilding, I think um, simply kind of recapitulates humans controlling environments in a way that, you know, won't really create anything like rewilding. I, I think what you're describing is a really fundamental shift in our relationship to the things around us. You know, the microbiome um, being an example that immediately comes to my mind of a kind of way in which we, um, for, you know, about a century have been trying to kind of kill off microbes in a, a kind of total war um, of uh, antisepsis. And, you know, what we're starting to recognize now is that there is a symbiotic and, and a, a kind of communalist relationship between these um, uh, microbiota and our well being, that we are, in fact, not an individual, not the Cartesian um, subject, but we're actually an ecosystem ourselves of trillions of organisms. Um, and we just happen to, um, in our consciousness, think that we are individuals. So I think it's going to require shifts like that kind of thinking where we are actually kind of um, letting the biological world kind of take back over agency within this. So I think your observation is, is great. And it's really going to change how I present that information going forward, because I think we really do need something more fundamental than just simply like reintroducing apex predators. We still control that game. And this is really, to my mind, a, a, a game of kind of giving up control. Um, Jamer, on that, on that front, I just want to add that we have, uh, and I don't know where she's uh, uh, this moment, but um, we have with us Marta de Meneses. Uh, you should check out her work. She has spent her whole career exploring the boundary between the self and other organisms. Yeah. And her husband is an immunologist, a famous immunologist. Oh. Wow. And she's currently doing a PhD at Oxford of art and biology. And I really do check out her work. She's with us now for the third year running, absolutely phenomenal artist. Anyway, I, uh, someone had a question for you. Hi there, um, my name's Geraint. Thank you very much for that fascinating um, presentation. And I definitely think that people need to think spatially and scale is a part of that every time we approach um, a problem. I was wondering to what extent um, mobility is the enemy of scale. And when you know, you're showing these squares and as we move out, um, the scale isn't the problem. It's the fact that we want to move beyond our own scales. And I was just thinking of how you know, this idea of unraveling um, forgetting, unpacking, and how difficult that is, because we've just gone through what you could argue is a moment where we have a big reset, right? COVID, every, you know, the majority yeah. of the world was stuck in this one place. But then how quickly we've gone back to old behaviors. You know, we saw during the time when we were stuck in the house, like, you know, those videos of, you know, in Venice and the dolphins returning and all these, you know, environment quickly claimed yeah. space. But then, um, the fact that we've quickly gone back to old behaviors. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I don't know if that's a question or stuff, but I'm just wondering how much mobility, yeah. if we have to, maybe, you know, your list of different things, does mobility keep, come into that, which would require also unraveling freedoms as well, in the sense that, you know, <laughs> nature was, and the ecosystem was healing, um, if it was ever perfect anyway, but, you know, um, but then there's something inevitably human, right? We've all flown here, probably, most of us, um, to this conference. We could probably have this conference online, but there is an energy and something you can't replace by us all being in the same room together. And I just, I, I, yeah, again, I don't know if I have a question, but like, 
is it easy to change those behaviors? And maybe talk about mobility. Like, does that mean we have to restrict freedoms and mobilities as well? Would that come into this unraveling? Yeah, well, one of the, um, the questions that I, I hope I get every time that I present this work um, is the question of sort of who gets to unravel um, and who chooses, you know, like who chooses to unravel Facebook? I can tell you some people who won't. Uh, want Facebook unraveled, uh, and they have a lot of resources. So, um, and you know, the the question about defunding the police um, is not one where everyone is in favor of kind of the unraveling of the um, police state. So, um, there's you know, hidden in this, in my sort of oversimplification of unraveling, is some pretty profound political questions about what it means to, you know, if we're going to unravel search or if we're going to. Um, if we're going to unravel air traffic, I mean, excuse me, uh, air um, travel, uh, you know, that would be a really, this would have been a moment to your point um, to really profoundly think about how that might work. Of course, you have to, uh, you know, we have to recognize the fact that the, you know, the kind of electronic moving of um, information in our presence has its own environmental impact, but um, let's, uh, maybe just um, suggest that, that if that's less than air travel in terms of carbon impact, then, um, you know, what would it mean to kind of unravel those things? And I think it is, it's, it is, you know, the question is, is, is it living with less? Are, are we simply talking about less? And I think that's the, that's the worst way we can go. I think we have to, to my mind, what's really interesting is, and the reason I use the Monderman example is, can we see the kind of unraveling as a new sort of freedom? Um, so maybe it's a different, aesthetics that we have to develop a different kind of attunement to the world around us um, so that we don't see these things as losses or of sacrifice or of giving up but they're gains uh, you know the the removal of automobiles from Copenhagen has created a you know one of the most livable cities in the world from from what the surveys suggest so you know I think we also have to understand what freedom means and freedom is not individual choice but freedom is something other than that, um, or freedom isn't that sort of um, capacity to have mobility at all moments, but is instead something else. And, and in that sense, I think we're really talking about kind of fundamental shifts, not only in how we see the world, but how we act in the world. So it's a, you know, it's a big ask, but it's a big ask because, you know, I happen to be sitting in a country that seems to be fully unraveling um, in ways that uh, are not particularly healthy. Um, and, you know, it doesn't feel like we have any means to stop it. So I'm really grasping at whatever concepts I can to try and think about how we kind of operate in the present. And just to make it even harder, how do you unravel the current temporal dimension that we are suffering yeah. from in a big way? Yeah. How do you, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, all the, all the sort of slow, slow down um, stuff that right. was actually being really kind of taking hold during the the pandemic and it was actually doing people a lot of good um, and what has happened now I mean we are in October a terrible terrible month for you know usually anybody's sort of schedule and you know I mean I had like yesterday a 24-hour day like work day you know this kind of yeah. crazy stuff you know yeah. how do you unravel that yeah you can't. Well, I think people have to ex uh, I think in the end, people have to experience things. And I guess it goes back to my um, my answer to the very first question um, about the, you know, I often think that <clears throat> if you want to talk to people who understand climate change, talk to people who've lived through forest fires and floods. They understand climate change at a very different level than those of us who've been privileged to live in areas where the climate change is more of an abstraction <clears throat> or a set of scientific um, uh, understandings. And so, you know, I almost feel as though it's the only way we're going to change our behaviors is by getting to that level of the phenomenological of the kind of felt world. Um, and unfortunately, the digital world is in some ways, and part of what I'm trying to argue is, it, you know, is the phenomenology of that world is fundamentally different uh, and affords different kinds of things um, for better and worse. I'm not, it's not a judgment. It's more just an observation. Um, but I almost think that if we're going to understand what that other, I mean, I had this wonderful, you know, this is a bad example, but I just had this wonderful moment traveling back from Australia recently where I was somewhere in the world. Um, I'd, I'd asked for a, a glass of whiskey um, and 
because I was the one to fall asleep. And I just realized I'm sitting, you know, having this drink and I'm, I don't even, I don't know where I am. I don't know what time it is. And the flight attendant came up with a meal and, I, and she said, well, here's your, I don't know if it's breakfast or dinner. <laughs> it's like, I don't know either. Like I'm totally lost. I have no idea what time of day I'm moving through time zones. And, you know, maybe we, maybe we need more feelings like that of just um, loosening or unloosening the, uh, the uh, I guess it wouldn't be unloosening, loosening the, the systems that we've built um, and being willing to trust that we can live without them um, in some fundamental way and seeing what happens. I mean, usually in, in disasters, uh, COVID is, is unique in the sense that in most natural disasters, fires, floods, earthquakes, um, people came together socially or people come together socially in those situations. And you see the social fabric knit tighter as a result of people um, rallying together as humans to help each other. COVID was unique in that we had to be afraid of each other um, and in invisible kinds of ways. And so, you know, I think that we're, there's a funny way I keep thinking of Chernobyl in the way that, you know, the Chernobyl disaster has led to the kind of rewilding of the ecosystems around Chernobyl. Um, you know, is it going to require certain levels of disaster? Um, for us to feel this enough to really change. And I hope not, but, um, you know, that, that might be what I would conclude in this moment. Yeah, uh, cheers, cheers, James. Uh, my name's uh, Louis. Um, so much of what you said uh, really resonated with me, actually. I thought it was a really interesting talk. So thanks for, for you know, Thank you. coming along and uh, giving the talk. I think especially to do it like... Uh, hierarchies, and I think there's so much about human behavior that is taken for granted as being human nature, and so much of it is kind of uh, brought out from these systems that we have to navigate from age four or, or younger even. Um, my, uh, my question to you is, I guess there seems to be a, a, a bit of a, almost like a contradiction between the idea of design and the idea of unmaking and I'm just wondering, how do you, how do you design something that to unmake a system? And can you give any kind of uh, like real world examples of projects that you think is a design project that's unmaking something? Well, yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, the Monderman example was an attempt to to show a, a sort of an approach to an unmaking, um, and I think that the. You know, um, Mikkel Koval Anderson, who, who works in Denmark um, and who works on sort of uh, bicycle transport in the city, uh, is someone who has a really interesting, he has a way of sort of showing the, um, the, the streets in Denmark 30 years ago and then 100 years ago um, and now, and how much kind of now looks like 100 years ago in Denmark because of the absence of cars mm -hmm. in those cities. And, Again, I think one of the things that intrigues me about that is the idea that um, that the unmaking is not a movement back to 1920. Um, it's not an idealization of 1920, but it's a recognition that there's a there's a future in 2040 that may look radically different than our present and built upon very very different principles that in some ways might harken back to 1920. But the reason it harkens back to that is because that's before we built the infrastructure of automobiles. I mean, it was at that point horses and carriages um, and a few automobiles. But um, so there's the, so there is this kind of, so there are there are things that um, you know start to look like that um, look like a kind of unraveling. Um, I'm trying to think if, if I have another example off the top of my head, but it's also um, I think you 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 identify really um, a key kind of contradiction in the work that the you know design has always been um, you know a, a means of control um, and an agency for power and access to resources and the capacity to to shift the environments around us. Um, so in many ways, maybe design is the is you know part of the problem. It might even be the problem. Um, what's useful to me is I like kind of keeping it in the conversation um, because I think that we uh, we kind of have to keep that tension there. Um, we can't just kind of run away from that. One of the things that, you know, one of the reasons I started thinking about this also was 
because there was such an obsession with futures all of a sudden in design. I've been tracking this for about 10 years. Um, and now everybody is doing futures, every company, every whatever. And I just thought, like, what's, why is it that the future is suddenly so exciting? And it's because it's an escape from the present. Um, and it's, you know, a hope that maybe there's a future that isn't as crappy as today. Um, and I just felt like, well, maybe the problem is not that we need to find that better future. Maybe we have to really look at the crappiness and, you know, figure out how to make it. And so it's, you know, it is, it's, it is design, it's not design. Um, you know, I, I don't, maybe I'm just too long in design to, to think without the word design, um, but maybe it's, you know, maybe in the end it's chaos, maybe it's emergence. Um, we have other words for kinds of systems um, that operate along different principles that don't involve hierarchies um, that aren't linear. So, um, but we, you know, I think we have to start sort of pushing those directions and it's really, um, it's it's incredibly challenging and it's really uncomfortable. Um, but you know, I sort of feel like this is at least a small contribution that I can make to that conversation. Jamie, it's Dubber here again. Um, I, I know we've used a lot of your time, but I, I want to ask one more thing before we kind of let you yeah. go. There's a lot of things to unravel, um, and and <laughs> some of them seem un unravelable. Can you yeah. unmake New York? Can you undo British politics? Can you? you know, um, mm. uh, rewind climate change, you know, is this an exercise in, in optimism? Um, are there things that are just, you know, like trying to unravel them is actually a futile activity. Um, how, how positive are you that we can make a significant or, or a sufficiently significant impact through unraveling? Or is it backpedaling while we're hurtling down a hill? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great, that's a great image. Um, yeah, that's exactly, that may be exactly what it is. Um, a friend of mine uh, used to say there's an expression, um, going to hell in a handbasket. And his friend is a designer and he was saying, well, we may be going to hell in a handbasket, but I want to just make sure we designed a really nice handbasket. Um, and so it's a little bit like that, um, you know, rearranging the uh, deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, I think that the um, there's a wonderful book that's if it's not come out it's, it'll come out soon by the Australian philosopher Tony Fry designer philosopher um, who who talks about defuturing in his work which is a, a concept that's been really influential for me and, and he has a book of fiction um, coming out which imagines um, a city in Australia uh, that has to move because of um, rising uh, ocean levels and what it would, and, and then it explores through this kind of fictional scenario, um, what it might look like for a city to have to move itself from one location to another location and what would be intention, what would be the political processes. Um, and it's a really interesting thought exercise to your question about, you know, is this something we can do? And I, and I think, you know, my answer, and it's maybe a cop out, but, um, what I'm sensing more and more is that um, crisis forces us to do this um, and we won't operate until then. Um, we won't unravel, we won't um, uh, sort of unmake these systems until crisis forces us to. And then we're very capable of it um, and we may remake it. Um, so I'm not suggesting that, you know, just the, the unmaking will result in um, a brand new, say chaotic um, system, but I do think that the urgency has to be present at a level that's really different than we're feeling in the sense that the abstraction of climate change for a lot of people is not enough um, to get people to change, but you talk to people who are in the midst of it and they are unmaking and remaking their lives um, around kind of different habitation and settlement patterns and things like that. So um, I wish there were kind of an easy answer, um, but uh, you're, you all are stress testing my concept in really great ways, and I'm gonna have to think through some of these, so I appreciate that. Wonderful, thank you so much. Jema Hunt, a big round, oh, I'm sorry. There is a last minute question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I just, just what, because I, but thank you. I'm Jan, by the way, Oman. Um, uh, and very nice to meet you. Th thank you for, for a very nice, uh, mind blowing, I must say, speech. But just one question because showing all these scales, 
you actually, to me, show that, because a lot of the things we've been talking about that I work with as well is sort of just realizing that we need to connect things in different ways that used to be separated. Mm. Uh, how can this, what you're doing now, be, I, I don't know if you work with this, but I guess you have, uh, be a tool to actually connect things that have been in different entities? Are you, okay, that's the question. Yeah, yeah, so uh, that's a great observation. I think, um, you know, one of the things I was trying to suggest about this sort of scalar framing um, is that when you are able to kind of shift the advantage from which you look at a problem, um, that it immediately opens up to you new kinds of partners, collaborators to work with that you wouldn't have seen at the scale that you were typically operating. The argument that I've tried to make is that most of us tend to uh, get in a certain frame of mind when we work on a, a project or a problem, uh, uh, however you want to describe it. And we tend to focus, we tend to habituate into a single scale that for us is normative. Um, and we don't understand that it's one scale amongst many. What I'm trying to suggest is if you were able to take the sort of conceptual leap to move out two or three scales or to move downwards, to think about, if you're thinking, for instance, about an architectural problem of, um, you know, airflow within a, a floor of a building, um, if you move to the level of the cell, um, you suddenly start to think about, well, what does it mean um, to be understanding the organisms that live within that space, um, that are in that space already, what dust is composed of, the movement of air as it relates to kind of, uh, increasing the capacity for cells to thrive or not to thrive. You change the whole nature and you start to realize, well, maybe there are some people that I need to talk to um, that are much different from the ones that I think about when I typically think about, you know, um, heating, ventilation and air conditioning and spatial envelopes and dynamic airflow and things like that. So the goal of it is to really sort of fracture the habituated lens that we use when we involve ourselves in projects and to open up some different kind of vantage points on that. Um, it doesn't solve everything, but hopefully it gives us kind of a new opportunity to think from a different way. Um, and, and what I'm trying to argue in that as well is that what we have become habituated to with our relationship to sort of digital networks is a whole new series of kinds of um, relationships of, of uh, physics um, that no longer apply in the same way. Um, we think of them as still being like the world in the same way that we thought of, you know, the automobile as the horseless carriage, um, but we're not in that world anymore. Files are not files in the same way that they fit into a file cabinet in the past, but we use those metaphors because they help us navigate that space, but we need to be thinking and really different ways about the ways in which it's, sh it's shifting our perception. And I think um, Michaela's point about time, you know, just the kind of expansiveness of time now um, to where our day may be 16 hours or 18 hours. I've been talking a lot about people in Australia lately and my day is now moved to, you know, eight o'clock at night and nine o'clock at night as well as seven in the morning. And, and that's just stretching our day in new kinds of ways, creating a new normal for all of that. So I think that for me, the, the, the opportunity of the scalar framing is to really kind of open up um, and, you know, sort of recalibrate the lenses by which we look at things and hopefully in that provide us with new ways of making connections with, for example, microbiologists if we're dealing with these things, because maybe what we need to understand more than just kind of air conditioning is actually what the nature of these um, sort of biota and microbiomes are that we're creating in the built environment. And maybe those need to fundamentally shift in some way where we're creating um, organism friendly spaces rather than organism antagonist spaces. And so maybe those relationships become no longer so much about person to person, but become person to organism. So to your point, making new connections by shifting that scale, maybe we're starting to think about these relationships. A lot of, I mean, I've made the argument in other places that, you know, a lot of kind of the, the European modernism um, aligns with the hygienics movement of the 19th century, which was the elimination of 
um, disease, of dirt, of um, microbes from our environment. And that, that elimination is part and parcel of what um, sort of European modernism, the, the Siam group, et cetera, we're working on. And that maybe we need to be rethinking um, the, the way that uh, microbes can function in our environments as um, partners rather than as antagonists. I'm going to try one more time. Jay Mahant, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah. <laughs> Big round of applause. It's been a great pleasure. Wish I could be there with you. Thank you.